encontré este video de cómo se preservan autos en un lugar que no sé bien de qué es, que los meten en una burbuja, boludo. This is one of the most amazing locations we will ever visit in Barn Find Hunter. And if you can imagine a science fiction movie, people in capsules. Well, these cars are in capsules. Maybe six or ten six. were built. Yeah, like between six and eight, depending on okay. who you believe. Then this is the real rare one. We have we have some more car bubbles to unzip. And, and these cars stand out as probably two of the rarest culvers ever built. So this car came off the production line looking like that car, stripped the body off it, and built a new body onto a Cobra chassis. It has styled wheels, it's got the, uh, the wood trim. Amigo, it's a town and country. And es impresionante. Es como un lugar que preserva los autos a un nivel ya demasiado extremo. Four speed. Manual gearbox. This car was at the ribbon cutting ceremony for the Lincoln Highway. This is it's a 4000 pound, no. 20 foot long motorcycle. You think about it, this is 1913 and all of this all of these castings are one of one. Mira la cantidad de cobre que tiene, amigo. Miren la cantidad de cobre. So just think about this. This is the first water cooled V8. Yeah, I, I can't El primer V8 refrigerado agua. Real special that I'm standing next to probably the rare No, mira lo que se se mustan, amigo. Rarest Mustang on earth. We've been so fortunate on Barn Find Hunter to be invited to locations that are not open to the public. By giving us this opportunity to come to locations like we're in right now, it gives you an opportunity to see what you normally couldn't see. So I feel really privileged to uh, be able to bring you an opportunity like that. This is one of the most amazing locations we will ever visit in Barn Find Hunter. And if you can imagine a science fiction movie where people are kind of in suspended animation, people in capsules. Well, these cars are in capsules and there's dozens and dozens of cars that we've been given the opportunity to see at the Detroit Historical Society warehouse by Dave Marcioni. Dave, la Sociedad Histórica de Detroit. Enough. Well, I'm glad we were able to work it out to have you come visit us. We're very excited to have you here in Detroit. And and this is closed to the public. It's so if you think about a museum, a museum typically displays between 5 and 7% of what they own. So I know you've been to the collections of the Henry Ford. So this is where everything lives if it isn't out on loan or on display at our main museum. Era la so what de we Henry have Ford. in this building are 275,000 no artifacts that help tell the history of Detroit. Automotive and otherwise. Literally everything from hatchets that were found when they dug the Rensen from primitives up to we had our local auto parts store Murray's, which was iconic here in Detroit, close. And we got signage and crew uniforms and all that kind of stuff from them. So the goal is to tell the whole story, not just ancient history, but right up to the current events. So this is ancient history we're standing in. How old is this building? Well, this is an old Army Quartermaster building. So it built in 1942. And if you look at the pillars, they're marked. So this would basically been like the Army's version of Amazon. So this is where, in the World War II effort, everything would come here. They would put, say, a pallet of radiators from Toledo Jeep here. When they needed them, hey, go to D18, get me a pallet of radiators, and they would go out the back door, no, and you, you've seen our process. Tiene esta historia. The and then they would ship. So, so the, the public can't come in here. So if we have an opportunity, if you become a member of the Detroit Historical Society for a small fee, once a year we make a special tour available to our members, which we'll do. It's fully curated. We have a different staff member with each area. You'll get me in cars. Uh, you'll talk to all of our archivists, and it's a really, really neat experience. Got it. So you found that this is the, the best way to maintain these cars and these bubbles. Well, because we're in an older building and it's certainly not the sterile environment that we would love to have, mm -hmm. uh, this is our best case scenario. These are car capsules. Uh, we've been dealing with them since 1999. Uh, the, Phil and the guys there do a great job. They take care of our product. And some of these bubbles are more than 20 years old. 20 oh, años, amigo. Product. Yeah. So can you just give us kind of like the nickel tour through here? Sure. Any place in particular you'd like to start? No, you're, you're the guide. So if you want to come with me, uh, just an interesting one back here. Cadillac station wagon. That's one of only two factory produced Cadillac station Those wagons up until the CTSV era. Really? So it, when they were closing Clark Street plant, which was a huge Cadillac assembly plant here, the workers got together with the union and kind of after hours and, after, and on their own time made four vehicles to show, the, show GM that there was something viable that could be built at the plant. So they built two station wagons, oh, a okay, six door limousine you, and a hearse. This was built at the Cadillac plant. It wasn't subbed out to... Correct. This was... So, you know, they, they, there's been Cadillac station wagons, but they go through coach builders. Right, right, right. So this was built at Clark Street by GM corporate employees. So I got to tell you, I mean, the front is Cadillac. The back, to me, looks like Jeep Wagoneer. Well, it's funny because I've got two of these, the only two they built, and both of them have different taillights. So this mm -hmm. one has the earlier style fleet, uh, front-wheel drive Fleetwood taillights. 
The interesting thing, and it's it's kind of hard to see, unfortunately, in the bubble. You know how normally the you know you're a station wagon guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how normally the back seats are very no, plain, regardless down. of the trim right. level of the wagon. Oh, look at that button top. That's just a show. A button top that goes down to that trim level there. If they uh, as they're doing this in the plant after hours, metal finishing that whole roof oh. to section it is a lot of work. Putting yep. a putting a vinyl top, doing it the metal work and then putting a vinyl top over it makes the finishing easier. So what we thought we'd do uh, is just kind of walk through and you can say, yeah, this is that, this is that, this is that, and just yep. do a quick walk through, and then there'll be cars that we want to come back and spend a little more time learning about. Okay, so you want to do a quick walk and talk and then we'll come back? Yep. Okay. It's a 1925 Cañon. Rickenbacker. A Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was a World War I flying ace. And if, actually, if you look at the emblem on the grill, it's got his, the, that yeah. emblem was the emblem on the tail of his fighter plane. So Eddie the, Rickenbacker, Relative of Eddie Rickenbacker? The Eddie Rickenbacker, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. Wow. 36 Ford Phaeton, uh, beautifully restored piece, four door convertible, of course, because it's a Phaeton. Uh, the one on the end here is an AM General Mighty Might. They only made those for a couple of years. 2,400 pounds wet, flat four cylinder, all aluminum construction, full time all wheel drive. Flat four cylinders, water cooled, air cooled? Water cooled. Water -cooled. At that point, that was the 2,400 pounds was the capacity for a helicopter to lift. But they only made those for two years because in 63, Sikorsky came out with the Sky Crane, which had a lift capacity of 10,000 pounds. Uh, behind us is the Osceola. Yeah. That was Henry Leland's personal car. That is the first closed cab Cadillac ever produced. Mm, wow. And it, it, actually, it Fred amigo. Fisher, the uncle of the Fisher brothers, uh, did the coach work on that. Look how tall. I mean, just imagine how bad the aerodynamics are. And this has probably got a one cylinder. Yeah, thing. it's a one lung, multi-fuel, chain drive. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and ironically, the one next to it is Horace Dodge's personal car. That's a 1919 Dodge Coupe. I think wearing top hats was a big thing in those days. Well, and right? if you look at the picture, we have pictures of Leland with the car. He's standing next to it, and his forehead is almost to the top of that roof. Oh, he's that tall. Yeah, so even in, in that era, when an average man was 5'5", five five, Leland was a, was, a, was a tall gentleman. A big man in the car world. Indeed, on many levels. That's a, another Scripps booth that's called the Rocket. Two cylinder, um, standard driving position. Narrow. It was a big fad in Europe at the time, and when John Scripps booth spent his time there, he came back, and that was kind of where they went with And this it. was built in Detroit? Yep. Fiero next to it, two M4, 84, first year. That's one of the first 50, I believe. So, yeah, donated by Pontiac yep. in 1988. Huh. But it tells you the options, power windows, and tape deck, and whatever. Tape deck. This something you don't hear many anymore. <laughs> Kaiser. Uh, Kaiser. Is okay. it that, Kaiser is it actually. The, the significance of that was that would have been built at the Willow Run bomber plant. So after that plant was decommissioned, it was made yeah, available to manufacturers the because they wanted to keep manufacturing in the area, and that Kaiser would have gone down. The, so Ford didn't have any ownership of that plant after. Well, the it became it was a government it was a government entity. So whereas companies came in and managed it, a lot of times it was still government surplus. Yeah, this is Dave Watham. He's a. <laughs> he lives here. He's been here since he was 12 years old. I mean, it's <laughs> donated by his parents. <laughs> uh, another script smooth. Now, was there like a, a styling that, that little bullet in the front there? Yeah, the, the pony car, the pony has that. The rocket had the, the first car was the rocket. Uh, so this is the this is the pup. So if you look at this one, it's the first one to have a four-cylinder in it. Es que para mí este tipo de cuidados en la chapa, eh, va en el auto en general, eh, lo, que debe, lo que debe hacer es evitar la corrosión, evitar el óxido, la humedad, todo a otro nivel. Entonces te debe cuidar los cueros. And if you look, the driving position is the rear. De, de, de so todo lo que se puede oxidar y demás. Yeah, you couldn't put the person in the front or it would literally, you know, it would topple because it was because of your the change of the change of weight when you tried to turn it. But so this one's got mechanical brakes, belt drive, and they clocked it at 93 miles an hour. So if you could take a look over here, belt drive, there's like a little wire wheel with a belt going around it to the rear axle. I love that it's an actual wire wheel for the belt I drive. I love that. <laughs> it's the details that sell these things. Right. Wow. So we've got a 42 Packard. That would have been one of the last ones to go down the assembly line uh, before oh. they shut down for war. Amo so esa época, boludo. So, so think about this. Uh, car companies were ceasing production just about across the board. American car companies stopped producing in 1942, somewhere during the year. So at best, it was a half year of manufacturing before they went to building Jeeps and tanks and airplanes and whatever. So 42 cars are rare, but when you find a 42 car, it's usually plain Jane, plain Jane, just a s simple sedan, because many of them went off to become used as army vehicles or service vehicles or government vehicles. Here's a, here's a 
dressed up Packard convertible. That's no, a ver, yo, vos tendrías que haber nacido en esa época, Momo. Obvio, amigo. No, no. Yo tendría que haber nacido en el 30 y pico para en el 40 y pico, 50, estar de traje, vestido picado, fachero, con sombrero. Sí, no, no, no. La época, para mí, la época para nacer era el, el 30 y pico, para vivir el 40 y pico y el 50 y pico en las mejores. Me llama, me llama y no sé qué hacer, llama.